It's time again to follow St. Anthony into the desert. But what monastery shall we build there? How do our cells or caves work? The monastery is a precedent preserved in a persistent historical apparatus, including architectures, cultural practices, and so on, designed to link the question of how to make oneself with broader questions about how to make the human world. Rather than say that this monastery should be physical or virtual now, I'd prefer to say that it should be informational, portable, hyperlocal, forkable. Everywhere the internet is, and therefore everywhere capital is, it should be able to exist. It should also be able to exist in places that electronic technologies can't or shouldn't penetrate. Our cells should be similarly understood as nomadic architectures, holons, caves in actual deserts as well as in the desert of the real, hypercaves where we form, where we go to be consumed back into the earth. The holarchical cell is where we read and write, what we read and write with, what reads and writes us. In the monastery is the intentional assemblage of people and their selves, it maintains this foundational commitment to working on oneself with negotiated aid from like-minded peers in service of something larger. What monks tell us even today is that cutting away the frivolous temptations of the world, even if only temporarily, is not done to simplify the spiritual quest, but rather to amplify it, to allow the deepest psychic demons to rise out in their full, terrible strength Monks speak of praying while sweeping, chopping wood, serving others at table, indeed praying by doing these things, praxis extended to every breath and silent word. This organizing purpose at the heart of every monastic community, sealed by its architecture, laws, and culture, is then to center this struggle in negotiated support with others. The centrality of this purpose explains our interest in transposing monastic architectures into the present moment. The system of the world has become a unified stack, in Benjamin Britten's sense of the word, in service to capital. We can engage infinitely in describing and analyzing this stack and designing counter-strategies, but who are we as individuals at the end of the day? How do we become ourselves in spite of and in service to a ruined planet? It seems to me that it's a radical thing to approach with confidence this project of creating a self. If the overwhelming thing now is freedom rather than discipline, then the template of everyone's struggle is to be confronted with infinite possibilities, where positive statements about what one is or should be start to feel like reinscriptions of the old gods of discipline and punish. Even beyond the still useful critique of corporate yoga as putting spiritual practice in service to capital, there's a deeper issue, which is that there doesn't seem to be a more authentic alternative which takes seriously the sustained and arduous project needed to make ourselves better to our full potential. But some project must be possible, some virtues even. Something like Badiou's ethics, for example, is exciting because it points to a deeper conversation than what the notion of ethics now seems to be constrained to propose. But even this is still looking outwardly at society. What the monk asks is, what is my own face, heart, sex, mind, in a world that is without these kinds of ethics yet? What voice and handiwork must I assume beyond the external facing project of creating a more just society? Indeed, the political dimension of the spiritually personal is an important part of two great monastic religions, Christianity and Buddhism, at least in their historical formation. That is, that each represented in the moment of their arrival the articulation of a new operating system, one that consciously sought to create a totally new, in fact totalizing structure on the earth, one in which co-participants can meet each other as equals around a common general project. These were radical political and social projects that reimagined how the people of Earth could relate to each other in terms of 
new protocols instead of new laws, new design patterns. What this operating system entailed was not so much a list of commandments, after all, but an unlanguageable principle that, once communicated or understood somehow, could by design translate or render into distinct, contingent ways of being at a local level. Not laws then, again, but an ethos or spirit. Not a code of Hammurabi, but a code more like the glider in Conway's Game of Life, or like DNA itself. A code which contains multitudes, which generates emergent behaviors and properties through complex interaction with other codes. One, perhaps, that evolves. Today, this is what capitalist realism is, after all, the religion of the age, and the state religion in precisely the way that Roman religion defined the horizon of all life in its day. So, this is what we should seek to build anew, an operating system for the self and for the earth via a network of selves that provides a manner of interface between us which can help us work toward a greater society and which, crucially, works for this through formal concern for a kind of governing of the self, or creating of the self. Monasteries are the special case of this system in historical precedent, but not the only. If this praxis should produce anything like formal virtues, my own guess is that they should land at something like this. That the cosmic project of our age is properly one of reinventing the control structures that would allow a more free and intelligent society to steer our shared life on Earth. The desire for AI or blockchains can even be read as a desire for a similar sort of governing structure, but one in which we invent angelic lords to take care of us. In contrast, the monastic urge is to say, Shouldn't we want to struggle a bit to stay at the center of our own universe, so to speak? A center which we understand in relation to each other and in relation to the earth, but in which work that we do in our individual caves is the important work to do.